Hey family, you're tuning in to the Jimmy Bonds podcast on Philadelphia Radio. Pardon any technical difficulties as we are recording live on the Zoom platform. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Jimmy. Okay. Lights, camera, action. Some people thought I quit and I ain't giving satisfaction. From a different era, writing rhymes up on napkins. What you had to say was more important, man, than traffic. Yeah, I'm talking back. To, speaking of contemporary. What's good, family, and welcome to another episode of Jimmy Bonds Podcast on Philadelphia Radio. This episode is sponsored by Good Hope Road Studios. I'm your host, Jimmy Bonds, along with my co-host, Ty. T.Y., what's good, Ty? How you feeling? All good in the neighborhood, JB. Live from the 215. Live from the 215. Moving right along, family. Remember, you can call us with your comments and questions at 844-844-1244. Again, it's 844-844-1244. You can also email us at jimmybondspodcast at gmail.com. Again, it's jimmybondspodcast at gmail.com. It's J-I-W-M-Y. B-O-N-D-S podcast at gmail.com. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at Jimmy Bonds Podcast, on Twitter at Podcast Bonds. Make sure you join the Jimmy Bond Podcast Facebook group on Facebook and make sure we continue to open dialogue. Move right along, family. Tonight, 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 we have a special topic discussion as always, family. And this topic I know is important as I feel like all the topics are that we discuss, but this topic is very important because we are discussing the Philly housing crisis. Why are we discussing that? Oh, because it's important and people are talking about it, but just not in the mainstream media as you would think. So I thought it would be great to bring some some people, some friends on tonight with some experience and some expertise, some knowledge about the about the situation. So Catherine Rockman is from West Philly. She's a West Philly native. Shout out to West Philly. Ooh. A, definitely. You know, we are, we're, a, we're a West Philly radio station. So anytime we get a native, we got to shout out the natives. Okay. But she's a West, she's a West Philly native. She's a wellness caregiver and as well as a real estate agent. Damn, real estate agent. That's that's a that's a different game right now. That's a whole different ball game. So we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk about your experience with being a real estate agent, particularly right now. Particularly right now. Emma Fox, her partner in crime in this permanent real estate cooperative. Emma Fox is magical. She's a queer educator, play specialist, a facilitator of healing and also liberation. She has a background in early childhood education, and she's a community organizer. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. How you ladies doing? How you doing? How you doing? I'm good. Definitely. Thanks for having us. Listen, I'm glad you guys came on and talk about this subject. Now, I always give kind of like a prerequisite. You know, me and Emma, I met Emma at work. I meet a lot of people at work, strange enough, but I met Emma at work. We got into a conversation. The conversation talked about the housing crisis in Philly. And I'm talking to Emma, you know, with me, sometimes I can, I can carry a conversation forever about almost anything. But Emma was very passionate about this this topic. And I thought that I've been wanting to talk about this for a long time. So I thought it'd be great to have her on because of not just how passionate she was about it, but just her expertise, her knowledge about what's going on in Philly right now. And family, if it's going on in Philly, it's going on other places. It's going on in San Francisco. It's going on in L.A. It's going on in New York. It's going on in Baltimore. It's going on in Atlanta. There's a housing crisis, major, but it's very, very drastic in Philly. So, Emma, talk to me a little bit about, first, what your cooperative is and kind of how you and Kathy came up with the idea about starting a cooperative. Yeah, so we have been working with this model called a permanent real estate cooperative. We call it, it's called a PREC for short and fun. Um, And that is a model that came out of this organization from San Francisco, from the Bay Area called the Sustainable Economies Law Center. Um, And essentially, I my understanding of a PREC and granted, we're still very much learning as we go and and like in the research phase. But our our understanding of it is that it's a, a strategy to take properties, both residential, commercial and land like green space off of the speculative market and render it permanently affordable and community owned. And um, the reason why doing that in a cooperative way is cool is because cooperatives function based off of membership. So you can have like community members be a member of the cooperative and basically have like a share in the cooperative. And then they get, they have financial stake, but they also have decision-making power as to how development happens in their communities. So it's it's a way to fight gentrification, a way to um, combat the, the 
kind of what I think in our conversation, we were describing it like, um, for me, I was thinking of Sailor Moon when like the dark crystal like virus takes over the city. And and like, that's how energetically I think of gentrification in West Philly, particularly with the universities, like so openly saying like, it's great by 2040, we'll be all the way out to Cobbs Creek and are like creeping further and further west. Yeah. Um, so this is a way to reframe that development isn't bad like we want development to happen but we just want it to not be happening in a way that's displacing the people that are already there and that like the people who are already there get to benefit from the development yeah for sure i mean gentrification is major right now i mean it's been going on for a while and Catherine, since you're a west philly native Mm -hmm. i mean you've got you got to see gentrification up close kind of just in a I mean, just as the years go by, it just keeps happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. What, what do you, I mean, I can, I could ask you, how do you feel about gentrification? That's not really what I want to ask. I'm mm-hmm. really asking you being a West Philly native, how do you, how do you personally feel about what you see your community transforming into? I think that I've seen some good things with it. Um, what bothers me about it is the culture shift that happens. Okay, and... let, let, let's talk about the culture shift. Let's talk about that. Let's so talk about mm-hmm. what, what do you mean by culture shift? Um, you know, neighborhoods have a certain energy. Yeah. Um, even West Philly is different than North Philly is. It's different yeah. than South Philly is. Different than Southwest is. Yeah. Um, and with gentrification in any of these areas, the culture, the people, so the businesses that are around. Yeah. Um. And just the energy, you know, it's a different energy. It's like when you, it's a lot of strangers, it feels like. Uh, so um, I feel like that, that kind of sucks. And I think when you're seeing spaces that are run down or dilapidated and you see the potential in these spaces, but then you see the strangers have taken advantage of the potential and yeah. you and the people that are already in these communities aren't able to, um, it's a little, it just makes you kind of feel, I'm going to say helpless, but you know what I mean? Like, kind of like taking over. Do? Yeah. yeah. What, what, what am I, what are we, what are we to do about this issue? Right. You know? And, and I, I want to just say that it's, this isn't about like, oh, we hate all developers or we hate all, you know, investors. That's not what this is. This is really about pinpointing really what what people are seeing in their everyday lives like change happens it's going to happen things places are going to change i'm born and raised in dc dc is not the same city it was when i grew up so it's not the same and mm-hmm. philly isn't either and you know my family's from west 57th and spruce and that whole area is completely different now than what it was when i was growing up so i got you know and working at a newspaper i really got to see how these areas were changing and i mean not just the change as far as ge- geographically and the people within the community but just like the ideals and the philosophy of the community changes as mm-hmm. well you know if if it, it could be a, you you could have grown up in a place where you knew everybody and all those people passed away you know all those families moved out all those families sold those properties mm-hmm. and when that happens those communities are really they're fractured and they're not the same as they used to be you know what i'm saying so it's it, it's really it's not just a crisis. It's something that's been going on, I guess, over the last two decades. And now we're at a point where it's like, it's no way in the world we're going to be able to get our communities back. That's really kind of like where we are. Ty, how you feel about it, Ty? What you think, bro? You from, you're a West Philly native all day. What you do? What do you think, man? <laughs> yes, well, I, I've seen the uh, gentrification and a change coming years ago. We actually used to talk about it back in the late 90s how the university, University of Penn was working their way towards 63rd Street and how Temple was working their way up and down Broad Street going towards Center City. And you also have Drexel too. They're taking up some property as well. Um, But one of the questions that I have is um, like, what is the process for acquiring property with that organization? Like, how do you go about acquiring the property? What are the steps? Okay. So yeah, this has been... um... So we're I'll, I'll start by saying where we're at in this process because it's been a, a year of us um, trying to understand how to start. I think starting it is the hardest part. It is yeah. what I'm hoping because it's been really challenging. 
Um, but essentially we, the advice that we were given, we met with some of the lawyers from the sustainable economies law center, and we spoke with, um, people who have started similar things in different cities. Um, and the advice was to just before even incorporating as a cooperative, like get a property to start with. And so then we have just gone through, I think a pretty interesting process of how how much home ownership is for like cis hetero married couples and so communities can't actually it's not set up for like individuals or like even communities or like everyone just thought that Catherine and I were like a gay couple (laughs) trying Mm -hmm. to buy a house together um they're like oh are you married um and so just like that's an interesting thing and that's a telling thing how like this market is is like programming us towards a certain way of being yeah. um but but I think essentially too there's um once you have the cooperative like the way that the there's the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative or the EB Prec um has acquired properties through various strategies so there's like crowdsourcing funds and getting what's called investor members into the cooperative who buy like at least one $1,000 share or they can buy up to um, 10 $1,000 shares of the co-op. And then those that those investments go towards purchasing a property through like the speculative market, but then it's put into the cooperative and taken off of the speculative market permanently. Like once it's purchased by the cooperative, it has to um, it's under agreement that it can't be sold back um, at market value. There's like certain bylaws that the cooperative is in agreement with when going through that process. So, yeah, I think I, one of the one of the permanent real estates that we were looking at, they were gifted a house from like an elder white lady who like saw it as an act of reparations and was like, I have to give this house away. <laughs> um Another one started with a building of, I think it was like 10 tenants who were going to be evicted and they pulled together their resources and um, convinced their landlord to like do something ethical, which is rare, Um, but the landlord agreed to, to do it and sold them the building like below market value and took their effort seriously. And then they started a permanent real estate cooperative with that property. So Catherine, is there anything else that you want to add to that? No, so I think just adding to the um, what we've done, um, we started off with the intentions on purchasing a triplex, which was just, you know, the prices are super high in West Philly yeah, um, to get a triplex, and it's a super competitive market to get multifamilies. Um, so long story short, we weren't able to get that, and we ended up just purchasing a single family home. So that's where we're starting off it. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. Ty, you had another question? Now, is there like a, a chain of command that you have to go through? Like how are the decisions made? Like who makes the decisions or is it, I guess, a cooperative decision-making process? Yeah, there's um most of the, so again, we haven't formed any of this yet. So right okay. so far in the last year, it's been Catherine and I on And for a while, we had another person involved, like on Zoom, just talking through everything and like envisioning things and figuring out how do we get the first property. Um, And right now we're renovating the property. And once we have that, it'll be like our intention is to kind of gauge the neighborhood and like see um, like how people if people are interested in in doing something like this in our neighborhood instead of uh coming in and like replicating kind of colonizer vibes of like we have this great idea um (laughs) so we so far in our operation it's just been us like talking through how do we want to handle um basically owning a property together and then eventually turning it over into this cooperative that we are going to build. Um, but in in a functional permanent real estate cooperative, there's it's described as as like a solar system or a galaxy, which I am into. Um, I guess this is recorded, but I'm 
on Zoom pretending I'm on a spaceship. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I I think basically there's different like constellation, uh, almost like a council model within the cooperative assuming that it gets to a point where there's a lot of people involved there's a lot of like over like 50 community members and over 50 investor members and then there's also resident members and staff members um each of those constellations pick a representative to serve on a board for a term um so and the cooperative decides like what that looks like a term could be like a year or four years or two years or six months, like whatever, however often you want to rotate leadership. Um, and then the board is makes the decisions through a democratic process. So um, if if a community, let's say people were like, oh, there's a, a storefront for sale on 60th Street. Um, we want to keep that in our community, we don't want a fancy yoga studio to move in. They could propose like, hey, let's purchase this property. Let's move the funds that we have from our dividends and like not give people dividends or whatever the decision is. Like they can make a proposal and then the board votes on whether or not that's something that feels in alignment with like overall community goals. Um, I think that's kind of the, the flow. That makes sense, Ty. It makes yeah. sense to me. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, when you think about a cooperative, I think people don't understand that. You got to think about it. Think about it in terms of a group, a group of people coming together, putting their money together, getting shares of that property. And correct me if I'm wrong. Not you know. So if I'm saying something incorrect, please mm-hmm. tell me. So it, the idea is that you want the share that you put in to gain value as the property appreciates. So mm-hmm. if you are trying to it, the idea is to not have it so that it's so investor driven within a particular geographical area, which is happening a lot in West Philly, North Philly, Southwest, even it's happening everywhere. Investors are coming and taking over. Right. And the idea of the co-op is to not put a stop to that. Cause that, that, that's kind of hard to do anyway, but I mean, really curvy. So I think that, Explaining what a cooperative, I think, is important because some people don't like. Oh, what, what in the world is a cooperative? You know what I'm saying? But I don't. I don't understand what a cooperative is. So, I always want to give a, a not a close to exact definition so that people can be like, okay, I get it, I understand it. Because you see co-ops everywhere. You see co-ops for grocery stores. You see co-ops for, for I mean, for many different things. So I just wanted to make sure we got that right. Now, let me ask y'all this question: As you were going out to look at homes and purchase homes and being I guess, um, prejudged <laughs> what, <laughs> I mean, what it, I, I really want to know, like the experience coming from that, like when you walked out of a situation or out of the room, what did you say to each other? Were you like, yo, what, what the fuck was that? You know what I mean? Did you have like that, that like, kind of like, like those people think we were really gay. Like that's so small minded, you know what I mean? Like kind of thing going on. Like I, I really want to know. Cause I, for me, I always thought that, you know, it would be easy to purchase property in Philly. And five years ago, I was trying to do it. I didn't, I couldn't find anything. I put in 40 bids, got no responses. I mean, cash bids, no responses. So Mm -hmm. there is, people always say that there is no redlining or redlining is against the law. There is redlining going on. And there has been redlining going on. More to the effect of, if you think you have the money to purchase something, does not necessarily mean you're going to be able to purchase it. And you know, so I mean, I said a lot, but we can walk me walk me through those experiences if you can. Uh, I think us being together, it happens a lot for whatever reason. So when it does happen, it's just something we started to notice and like, oh, that's so funny. But it's interesting to look at in this process because that's the automatic assumption that yeah. the only reason that two people would come together and purchase property is because they're coupled in some way so it was more just interesting to look at and just kind of recognize like okay this is how we're being perceived this is you know what I mean this is what people are thinking um yeah so I mean did did that did that make you because for some people that might it's not not necessarily a turn off it's a you know oh no we got to do this now we have to do this you know what I mean that type (laughs) that type of attitude or was it more like like you know Okay, next time we go in, we're gonna have to, you know, we're gonna play it cool or we're gonna do XYZ. Cause it's not, it's, it, you can qualify all day to buy a home. That doesn't mean you're gonna get it. 
So, I mean, I, those are those are things I'm always thinking about. People have these people have 780 credit scores and have $10,000 for a down payment and still not getting these homes. So, you know, for, for me looking at it from just, just based on what you were telling me, I'm wondering, like, is it, is it more about, is it more about how we're perceived within the people that now own those properties that we, that we wish we had, or we, we wanted to buy? Is it that, or is it like, there is a, a, concerted effort to make sure that certain groups of people or certain types of people do not move into these places or do not move into these communities. Do What, what do you think it is? Um, I think it depends on where you're at um, when it comes to those type of efforts and that type of perception. Um, it's definitely certain people that want to sell to certain other type of people and have questions. In our situation, it was actually really interesting because um, the other agent called me and said, um, you know, are you guys investors? Because this was um, a mother that passed and the son was selling the house and he really didn't want to sell it to investors. And so he went with us because we weren't investors. He was like, you know, the home has sentimental value and I really want to give it to somebody who is um, going to stay there and respect the home and be building community and be a part of the neighborhood like how my mother was so I think that was a really positive experience yeah. um, for this particular house and also speaks to just us being able to get it and just you know going into that space and having the right energy um, just kind of come to us with what we're doing um, but definitely in other spaces um in other homes and you know at different price points <laughs> the energy is going to be uh a little bit different yo she she Ty, you see how politically correct that she said it in other spaces in other <laughs> different types of arenas price points yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm saying like oh price points yeah okay i, I get it i definitely get it now nah, i mean it makes sense yeah. It, it, it makes sense. It sounds like we had a visitor over there. It sounds like you rubbing him. You rubbing him. He, he, yeah, he he's he's stressing me out over here. I'm like, be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's all good. It's all good. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. But hey, no, Leo. <laughs> right, you know what I'm saying. But it's um, it, you know, I always found it to be interesting that we are, we all think that there is one simple solution to buying a home, right? It's just. You know, you get your credit score up, you get your down payment together and you're ready to go. And, you know, I think about what you what you ladies are doing, I think it's is it's a vital idea, you know, and you're already actually like pursuing it. It's not like it's something that's just like, oh, it's kind of, you know, we're just thinking about it. It's like you're in the process of doing it. It's happening. And I, I find it to be very empowering because. I, I, I'm looking for other solutions, you know what I mean? It's not always it's not always the, the generic system you have to go through you can create your own ways of doing things to get to the same goal and that's why i was i was so intrigued by what emma was telling me about the cooperative because i was just so like what y'all doing what i've never heard of it before <laughs> like that's that's crazy but i feel like this is this is kind of like the next thing you know what i mean and if and, and the thing about it is there are people particularly people of color particularly people who who are of like minds who have the resources to try to do these things to push forward, you know what I mean? To kind of change the narrative of what's really happening. Like we can't, I don't have enough money in my pocket to stop paying. I, there, there's not, there's not enough picketing I can do <laughs> in, in U city for me to stop them from, from already moving down. The same thing up in, up in North Philly and Broad street. There's not enough of, of anything we can do to stop this, but there is ways for us to curve it and make it, make it not just appealing, but affordable for people to have a roof over their head and they're re getting a return on their investment. That's for me, that's what's most important. Um, and, you know, like I commend you for it because I, I don't know who would do I, this is like, I've been in banking for years. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of nothing like this. So this is dope. This is super dope. Ty, listen, we're going to take a break real quick. When we come back, we're going to talk about renting in the city. We're going to talk about a whole bit, a whole bunch of other stuff. But fam, remember, you can call us with your comments or questions at 844-844-1244. Again, that's 844-844-1244. You can also email us at jimmybondspodcast at gmail.com. Again, it's jimmybondspodcast at gmail.com. It's J-I-M-M-Y-B-O-N-D-S podcast at gmail.com. You listen to the Jimmy Bonds Podcast on Philadelphia Radio, the indie station for the indie nation. We'll be right back. 
Hey, this is Michael from Up and Dabby. This is the Jimmy Bob Podcast on Every Dabby Radio. Welcome back to the Jimmy Bob's Podcast on Philadelphia Radio. We thank you for listening. Remember, family, you can call us at 844-844-1244. Again, it's 844-844-1244. You can also email us at jimmybondspodcast at gmail.com. Again, it's jimmybondspodcast at gmail.com. That's J-I-M-M-Y-B-O-N-D-S podcast at gmail.com. And welcome back to Jimmy Bond's podcast on Philadelphia Radio. Remember, family, you can call us with your comments or questions at 844-844-1244. Again, it's 844-844-1244. You can also email us at Jimmy Bond's podcast at gmail.com. Again, it's Jimmy Bond's podcast at gmail.com. It's J-I-M-M-Y-B-O-N-D-S podcast at gmail.com. Again, family, we're discussing the topic of the Philly housing crisis. We have two great guests with us, Ms. Emma Fox and Ms. Catherine Rockman. I think this is dope. Catherine or Emma was talking about something in the break. I wanted her to expound on her idea or or on her experience rather. Yeah. I was just expanding on, you asked about like what, what were like the conversations like between Catherine and I, when we were looking for properties in the past year. And um, I was sharing how Catherine as a real estate agent. So my, as you shared already, my background is very much in the like, magical like play creative like weirdo organizing world and then Catherine's background is more in the like real estate like I work and like so Catherine like understands the system um in ways that I am like screw the system and then like (laughs) don't understand the nuances to some degree because it's easy to be like whatever (laughs) (laughs) like it's all bad um and to oversimplify it and so I would I kind of like waltzed into these situations with my like vision and our like shared being like, this is what we're going to do with the space. Isn't this great? And like real, uh, the first experience we had that was terrible was the real estate agent thought that I was like a wholesaler telling like a, a terrible lie <laughs> to the, <laughs> the person and cussed out Catherine and was like, freaking out at Catherine being like I'm gonna report you and like all this stuff and it was drama high drama and and then um we had like another dramatic thing with another real estate agent and it's just it was learning how much to share like not to not to go and be like oh I'm not gonna share at all I'm just gonna front like I am a like straight cis person like moving in this space doing all the things like no I don't have to go that far but I I it was learning like how much to share and it was interesting when we arrived at this we were a little bit traumatized and I was like should I write a letter to this house and Catherine was like no and then it turns out that it was like they would have loved the letter because Uh. the person actually cared about what happened to the home um, and so I thought that was an interesting sidebar that we were continually having was, um, and, and I think also speaks to a dynamic that's important in, in what Catherine and I are, are growing here where like Catherine is a black woman from West Philly and I'm like a white queer from the suburbs of West Philly. And like that tension in the gentrification process is like very much something that we have to hold and work with in as we're navigating this right like that's like how gentrification starts in West Philly is like all the like white queers move into a neighborhood <laughs> so yeah um, yeah I, I mean also, it, yeah. I, I think is I think it's dope I mean here's the thing and if I when and if I put this out on video I always put it on the audio I think the dynamic that you and Catherine have are like yin and yang and I mean, Emma, definitely from talking to you, like I already, I already know your mental space as far as like being creative and the passion and the ideas and the wisdom, like, you know, what you've seen, your experiences. Catherine, this is my first time meeting her, but I can tell you she has, I can just tell from sitting here, she's had experience in this game. She knows this <laughs> real estate game front and back. She's been around certain people, but she's like, oh, I know what I'm going to say. I know what I'm not going to say. I know how I'm going to carry this. I know how I'm not going to carry this. And I think that you got to have both sides. Anytime you come up with an idea, anytime that you try something or you're trying to create anything, you have to have both sides. You have to have the passion as well as the sensibility. 
And I think those two play very well for what you're doing and what you're trying to, what you are accomplishing. And I'm not going to say trying anymore because you are actually doing it. You know, you are actually putting this into, into fruition. I mean, Emma, you guys already have a property. You're not looking for one, you know, Catherine, you have, you have spent time looking for one, but now you have one and that's the start of it. You know, many people will give up after like looking at the pro- the amount of properties you've looked at and getting nowhere. I'm like, I, I don't even know why we're even doing this. Why are we even trying? Right. Yeah, that's probably the ideas you had. Like, like probably at some point you care. Oh, I don't know. Why, why would I even try this? What's the point? You know, I think that's a big thing. <clears throat> Me and her go back and forth with about like the imposter syndrome of it. And just like, are we really going to be able to do this? Are we really doing this? Do we really know what we're talking about? Is this really possible? Is it really going to happen? Are people really going to like it? Um, so I think, yeah, that's definitely been a big part of this process. And I think still is. I can yeah, still talk about this. I mean, I can, I can, I can, I can completely see it, but I, I, but I get it though. You know what I mean? I get it. Like if anything, I can tell you when me and Ty started the podcast, I, I'm the one with the wisdom, not the wisdom. I'm the one with the vision and the manifesting. That's me, right? That's me all all day. I got to do this. This is what we're going to do. Ty is more concrete, sensible. You know, he, he keeps me even killed, keeps my feet on the ground, which you need a person like that around, particularly if you're going to work with him, you know? And his, he's a little older than, than I am, so it gives me wisdom. You know what I mean? Having different backgrounds assists you in getting to your ultimate goal. You know, your ultimate goal was to get your first property. You have this property, you get established. And the next thing you're going to do is get the next property. You know what I mean? It's, it's a continuous, a continuous strand. So I'm, I'll, I'll tell you, whenever you have those conversations, just keep going. You know what I mean? Just keep going. Like, don't stop because you're doing a really good thing, not just for yourselves, but for the community that you're in. And, you know, you're an example. So, you know, definitely. I mean, they, they, what do they say that the black and white people can't get along with certain things, particularly black people and, and people of, of different, you know, communities. They, they say we can't get along. And I mean, that's obviously not the case. So, I mean, I'm, I'm digging it. I think you guys are going to do some dope, dope, dope ish for real, for real, for real. Okay. My bad. Anyway. So <laughs> as we talk about this, I mean, do any, do either of you two rent currently? Oh, not currently or previously you had rental experience i'm I'm sure right mm-hmm. <laughs> Emma's a good person to talk about this but Emma, yeah, go ahead. Emma's a good person to talk about this so I mean first of all, I don't think people know about Philly rent, okay I think people just think that it it's like it was ten years ago you can just get an apartment and it's cheap like no today's rent in Philly is astronomical, okay. Mm-hmm. I think the median average was $1,400 a month. Okay. And if you're making close to $40,000, $42,000 a year, that's one paycheck right there for your rent. One paycheck. If you get two in a month, that, that the other one's gone. How are you surviving on that? So the fact that rent has soared as the way it is, many people think that it has to do with investors and outsiders people from other places coming in and moving what do you what do you feel about the outsider element coming to philly like how do you feel like that's played a role in in the real estate market and and really in the housing crisis (laughs) Catherine, go ahead okay um what i will say and when mayor nutter was here he was very focused on building the philadelphia economy in a way that i haven't seen before so he was like can I curse on here? Yes. Oh, he was like, fuck the neighborhoods. But he was building up the attractions and all of those things. So yeah. I'll give him that. From that, I mean, I'm, and the gentrification, you know, development things were really kind of already in swing. But he really kind of pushed it along. Um, and a big portion of um, the development and gentrification absolutely is from it's so many people that live in the city that are not from here now it's yeah. been a huge like wave of people that came and moved here so a lot of those people that are able to afford those uh astronomical rents now are coming from places that are way more expensive and so coming to philly is like oh my god so cheap here everything's so affordable when yep. you live here it's like oh my god everything you know rent used to be seven hundred dollars eight hundred dollars yep. and you could live somewhere decent um so it's definitely an outsider influence that has pushed this to where it's at now and even still i I will say i think looking at it now 
and um, I used to live in New York. And so I was like, oh my God, the rent, everything is just so expensive. But in while Philly is still cheaper than New York, it's getting, it's a little similar. It's getting the, you know, it's closing in on each other. So yeah. Yeah. it's interesting. I mean, New York is two hours away. You get on the train, you'd be there an hour and a half. I mean, you can take the hour mm-hmm. and a half every day and you'll be fine, right? Yeah. Just, just to go to work and you still, you'll come home, you'll make more and you'll come home to a place where you're paying less. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that that's ideal. Same thing in D.C. D.C. is about two, two and a half hours away. You get on the train, you'll be in D.C. in no time. That D.C. Mm-hmm. rent is just as crazy. So you're just like, if I can live in Philly, that's what I'll do, you know? And that's that's what you're finding. Part of the reason why, people, why, the, why the rent is sky, going sky high, part of the reason why people can't afford to live in the places that they, that they want to live, you know? The stats show that 47% of people in Philadelphia are renters. 47 percent that's half that's half of the people in philadelphia are renters so if it's half of the people that are renters and i'll I'll throw this other stat at you some people don't know there are you know when it comes to real estate it's about supply and demand there are there's not enough supply for the demand of what people need in the average city there's probably about twenty thousand twenty thousand properties rentals as well as homes available that's the average about twenty thousand in Philly, it's 6,900. Hmm. So that's less than half of what other cities have, which is part of the reason why the rent has gone up crazy. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm a renter. I'm not going fe- to front and be like, yeah, well, I, you know, I'm a home buyer. I'm a renter, and I hate paying my rent because it's just like it's money down the drain. Like, where is it going? Like, no, no disrespect to my landlord. He's cool folks and everything, but where's my money going? Is that That's it? You know, I paid that money just, that's it? For real? Just, that's it buddy that's it like <laughs> way to go good job you know it's that's the way you feel when you're renting that's the way you feel some people be like well you know if you own a home you got to pay for this you got to pay for that you got to pay for this it's like yeah but at the same time if i own a home at least at least the house is mine if the, if the land is in mine the house is mine and i could i could accept that but when you're renting the landlord can come anytime and say whatever they want and do whatever they want and you have really no recourse and and you're paying for them to have an asset. Like you are yeah. paying off mm-hmm. the, you're paying for them to have an asset and monthly income on top of them working towards having an asset. And so your money, you're basically funding somebody else's intergenerational wealth. And when you think about like the history and legacy of who can and can't build intergenerational wealth and then the disproportionate rates of who remains a renter and who can have access to home ownership in this country that's like a very intentional strategy to ensure that we don't get free from that level of like dependency on um on like maintaining those power structures of of like financial (laughs) rulership I also feel like it's a little bit of lack of knowledge too with people that are it's so many people that are selling their homes and then go start renting. And just like what you're saying, it's like your money is going down the drain. Whereas uh, while it might be a greater responsibility to own a home, when you're paying every month, you're paying into the equity of your property. So you're building, it's almost like you're building the money when you're paying into it. Um, so I think looking at it in that way, you know, might change some people's mind um, when they're doing things like that. But I don't know. I see it happen all the time now, even now. So, <laughs> I mean, but both of you said some really profound stuff. Like, I mean, Emma, Emma, Emma said stuff that I thought I would hear from somebody else of another hue. But um, <laughs> I mean, like, that's exactly what what it is. I mean, I don't want to. I hate to get so like, look, man, it's them against us, and they have done X, Y, Z. I don't want to be you know, pro anything. I'm saying what Emma said is completely right. Generational wealth is built on real estate most of the time. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you think about, even if you think about the the man, a lot of people hate, you think about Trump, his dad built their wealth off renters in New York for years. That's where he got his money from. That's what he does now. You have a property, you want to rent my name here. You're going to have to pay me every month to rent my name. He's built equity in his own name. For the properties now, I'm not saying anything else about him. I'm just saying that that is exactly where it starts. It starts with the foundation of the home, and whether you have a row home, you have a rancher, 
<laughs> you have you have a trailer, you have equity that you're building, and that's what I think people don't realize. Like you said, like you said, Catherine, education is key. And I think if we don't educate ourselves about how the process works and what we're doing, we, you know, we'll just keep going in the same cycles. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that it's like, yeah, well, you know, we all have to be homeowners or we all can afford it or we all can do this. It's the goal should be at some point to have something of your own. Cause after a while you get tired of paying rent. I remember when I was younger, I'd be running the streets and I would come home and I would just be like, yo, I, I just pay here. I just pay rent to go to sleep. You know, I I wasn't getting anything out of it. I just was always out. And I'm like, it's nice to have a place, but I'm not even using it really, you know? So mm-hmm. you, you you just realize that like, I mean, not, you know, when you get older, it's different because, you know, you got kids and you can roof over their head. You got a roof over your own head. You got to kind of think differently. But I mean, all in all, I can't stand rent. I can't <laughs> stand it. I can't stand. I mean, I, I really, I love my place, but I'm like, Man, I need to buy something. You know what I mean? And and not wait till you're old or, you know, oh, I'll wait till I get things in order. I'll I'll get it then. Like, nah, like you need to start looking now, particularly even with rates going up, particularly where people the cost of houses in Philly have gone astronomical. Just like the cost of rent, the cost of houses have done the same. So I mean, if you're paying twelve hundred dollars, fourteen dollars, fourteen hundred dollars in rent, you should be thinking about buying. If you can afford fourteen hundred, mm-hmm. you should think about buying a piece of property mm-hmm. because you just really not. That's really pointless to be spending that much money. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Todd, what you think, bro? How you feel, yeah. man? How you feel about about the rent situation? I mean, I know you got people that that rent right now. Right. Yes. Well, I mean, again, I, Catherine mentioned something. Whereas people from New York come into Philly, and I think we have a a demand for good quality housing. And you have realtors that are willing to get those properties up and make them available for people that can afford them, the $1,400 a month, the $1,800 a month. Uh, that's where the housing crisis come into play as well because that demand is there, but the supply is not there. And what I'm noticing in Philly is that these new properties that are going up, everything's brand new, washers, dryers, floors, walls. The fixtures, everything is brand new. And so I can I understand why their prices are so high because they have to pay for the investment that they put into the property, which makes sense. But again, at the same time, how many people are being displaced in Philly? We have so many renters that don't take care of their property. Is that the outlook moving forward? Like to continue getting property for people to rent? Like with your organization. Like, how do y'all see it moving forward? Is it like more of a, a rental property thing in Philly? Or is it more of like the co-op thing? Like, how do you see it moving forward with your group? So I actually want to, I want to, like, this ties into answering your question, Ty, but there's mm-hmm. something that you said, Jay, that I want to like push back on a little bit is that I don't, I think it's not actually beneficial to the collective for the goal to be private property and like individual ownership and actually if we look at the history of when property went from being commonly held to being privately held I think it was the Homestead Act which is rooted in colonialism it's dependent on slavery it's dependent on all of these systems of of like extreme extraction and exploitation um, in order to in- encourage and ensure that people can like have home ownership, have this individual ownership of mm-hmm. the land. And so we went from having these like commonly held spaces um, to, to having like that, this idea that like every individual has to earn the right to own this one piece of the pie basically Mm, Mm. um and so so our vision and and I think in a lot of conversations about what's what's called like building the solidarity economy and a lot of these um more like national movements to to move away from the extreme individualism that comes with extractive capitalism and colonialism and white supremacy and cis heteropatriarchy all the things like underlying that is the same energetic signature which asks us to be like really in our individualism and maintain that kind of private private property mentality and like I just have to look out for myself and I don't trust that anyone else is going to look out for me so I'm going to like 
put blinders on and ignore how I'm being complacent in all these things so that I can provide for me and mine. Um, like we have to move away from that and, and like start repairing that, that like very real mistrust in the collective and start um, like actually believing that people will act in the best interest of the community. Um, and I think that's, that's where we start in order to get to a place of, of returning to, to property being commonly held so that it's not um, like, we don't want to replicate the landlord renter relationship in the permanent real estate cooperative we want people to feel empowered regardless of how much money or like financial capital they're bringing in as as like a stakeholder in the cooperative that's the whole point right is that the investor members don't actually have more voting power than the community members who only have to pay five dollars to get a share versus like an investor member has to pay a thousand dollars so so like having the the model be one where people feel empowered to rely on the cooperative and collective process to to make decisions about like okay this person's this person hasn't been able to pay their monthly payment towards the co-op but they're living in one of our properties like that's hurting the whole collective like what do we do about this instead of it just being like, well, I'm evicting you and we're not going to have a conversation about it. Um, so it's, there's still like accountability and like recognizing, recognizing like terms and, and similar similarities in like the renter relationship. Um, but under the PREC model, for example, people get a return. They get the money that they put into pay, making payments. If they want to leave leave as a resident member they sell their share of the co-op and they get back what they invested with a we the cooperative decides a percentage it can be anywhere from like 1.5 percent to like five percent of a interest on what they invested so you're not just like giving your money away you're actually able to to benefit from it mm. um and i just went on a whole tangent <laughs> no you're good no you're good. So good. you're good you're so good now you're speaking my language over here you know i'm over here just paying attention like at yeah, 1.5 interest yes i know about that get them dividends. Uh-huh. yes i know about that yes you want to get a return on your investment or our old ROI, as people say, but I, you know, everything you said, Emma, is is key. It's it's definitely trying to change the old antiquated way of of living, landlord tenant, that kind of thing. And I mean, that's that's been around forever. And even you know, down in the south, when they're sharecroppers, that's kind of like the same principle, exactly. you know, yeah. as 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 what we are now. You know, you 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 live on or you work with the land and you pay a fee. You live in the, you live in the property and you pay a fee. And I mean, I think the co-op is, is more geared towards people having opportunity that they wouldn't necessarily have before, as well as getting return on the investment that they're going to put in. So you might, you, you would be looking for, you know, crowd, crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing investors who have the funds to put in. You can, you can even find people who already have properties and be like, you know what? That might be good just to put a couple thousand over here into this co-op to see, not even to see, but just to continue the process going. People always want to diversify. And again, like I said, I'm speaking, you're speaking my language. I talk this all day long. And I think that one of the biggest things about diversifying is appeal as well as the future. You know, like most people feel like the landlord tenant or owning a property, that's that's that is the future, but it's not really the future because people are doing different things now. And as far as different income, you know what I mean? So if you're going to if you're going to if you're going to invest in a co-op, you're you're thinking about the return on your investment, but you're also thinking about how you how the person that who you're benefiting, who you're helping, you know what I mean? And. I think that's what people, like you said, people have to think more about the mission behind it than just the, the, the money behind it. You know what I mean? And I think that's more, that's more important. It's about the mission than it is about the money. Hey, this is Michael from Up and Darby. This is the Jimmy Bob podcast on every Philadelphia radio. Welcome back to the Jimmy Bob's podcast on Philadelphia radio. We thank you for listening. Remember, family, you can call us at 844-844-1244. Again, it's 844-844-1244. You can also email us at jimmybondspodcast at gmail.com. Again, it's jimmybondspodcast at gmail.com. That's J-I-M-M-Y-B-O-N-D-S podcast at gmail.com. 
quick question for the ladies. Um, what challenges have y'all faced so far in going through this process? Mm. <clears throat> well, firstly, purchasing the property. That was uh, a huge ordeal. Um, yeah, going back and forth with the lender and finding yeah. the property and finding, just like we, uh, Jay was saying, there's not a lot of properties that really fit what you want to do and okay. um, fit into whatever your finances are. So it's really trying to find a needle in a haystack that really works um, and having the finance for that. Um I don't, Emma, do you have any anything? The I the question was challenges in what general. What challenges? Or? What challenges have you faced, right, with the process? I, I thought you said in faith, and I was like, well, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, just let go ahead, go. Emma. Go okay. ahead, Emma. I did not believe that God was real. No. Um, uh, yeah, I yeah, definitely getting the property. I think I think the imposter, like, on an, so I I am often thinking about um how important it is I basically just said this but how important it is to do the inner liberation work as you're doing this work in the world so like because the the I I just in organizing spaces have so often seen us inserting radical content into the same oppressive container because we haven't slowed down enough to do the work to kind of check ourselves and be like am I actually divesting internally as I'm divesting my resources and time from, from these systems and like relocating them to building something differently. And I think on, and on that level, I've had a lot of challenges come up <laughs> in this of, of noticing like when um, particularly around like scarcity stuff, stuff around money. Um, yeah. Just a lot of, I have, I have a lot of emotional attachment to the money that I was put investing into this it comes from um essentially like my lineage and my cycle of of like the people in my family having access to home ownership and then my mom passing away and then seeing what happened to my childhood home and feeling like I didn't have agency in that and then just had this like random like lump of money that I was like ah, I don't want to perpetuate this cycle and so I have a lot of like attachment to what happens with that and like working with that and working with Catherine and like having these like like 1 a.m conversations of like I'm feeling so anxious like what's happening and like the back and forth and and having these moments where you really believe a better world is possible and then moments where you feel like this is fucking stupid and like this money's just gonna disappear and what what are we even doing no one believes in this like that I think staying staying confident has been a big challenge and like mm -hmm. uh yeah that's real though that is that is real because anytime you start anything we put on the face of of this is what we're doing and this is who i am and i have no challenges i am great you see what i did but in reality there's so many drips of doubt in your mind or around you or with people that you surround yourself with that look at you like you're really gonna do this you know you know you're not you know you can't do this right you know, this is not, you know, this is the same thing that, that, that you were trying to get away from. You know that, right? And you have those constant thoughts in your mind. I mean, shit, I get it now. Like, yo, <laughs> I can't make this podcast like everybody else's. You know what I mean? Like, am I starting to sound like everybody else? Oh, I got to change this. Hold on. Let me, let me check myself real quick. And that's, that is a natural progression. Like, you don't want to have the imposter. You don't want to feel like you're an imposter. Like, you're speaking about being pro. We're going, we're going to get it. And then you're just doing the same shit as everybody else. There are so many situations like that. But I think you trying to, first of all, you recognizing it. And then second, you trying to make a difference in a sense of, okay, I, I, I'm going to make sure that this is in the front of my mind and not in the back of my mind, I think adds adds to what you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish. You know, like I would tell you not to get, you know, that those natural drips of doubt are natural, though. That is natural. But until you see yourself actually doing it and in the process of doing it, it's not real. Mm. You know what I mean? It's it's just an idea. And that's why I was telling you before, like, it's not an idea no more. It's actually you're doing it. You actually have the cooperative. Even though it's just you and Catherine right now, 
you actually have it. You know, I mean, think about your team, though. You have you and Catherine. As much as people will be like, well, that's just two of us. It's really about being having a partnership to that better goal, to that greater goal, to that to to the places that you see it. You know what I mean? You can look up 10 or 15 years from now and have different co-ops around the city that you felt like, yo, I, if I hadn't done this one, I wouldn't have done anything. You know what I mean? And that's why that's why, like, I understand your 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 anxiety behind it i understand you you're waking up at one o'clock in the morning like yo i'm full of shit like well, I'm, <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean <laughs> i'm full of shit like i I'm, I'm just i'm really just am i perpetuating this bullshit or am i really you know doing it and but they have a property so i mean that's like the good that's my right that's there. my they point have, though that's they my have point. the property they so have a property just get in the next one yeah and that's what it is you, you you work this one you work the hell out of it and you get the next one after that you know and that's you go from one to, it, you can't put you can't go 20 steps in one you know what i mean you got to go one step in front of the other in front of the other and eventually you get there you know eventually you get there the one thing i'm gonna say always say to emma is don't lose that passion shit happens in life shit can take that passion away it can make you feel different it can make you feel like 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 you said why am i doing this but that passion is what drives you to doing what you're doing you know, mm-hmm. that's what drives you to the to not just the co-op, but to your your philosophy about how we should live in our society. And I mean, that's what that's what engulfed me about you. You just were so like, yo, look, we, do you notice what's going on? I mean, she talking about gentrification. She talking about <laughs> systematic systems more than what I hear other people talk about all the time. I'm like, yo, OK, okay hold on, Kevin. This sounds like something that, that uh, Kevin, let me tell you, me, me and Ty talk about this kind of stuff all the time. This is this is Ty's mm-hmm. lane. Okay, <laughs> this is Ty's Lane. This is the system that's been set up, Jimmy. They set this up for us to fail. That's what they did, right, Ty? Is that not what we yeah. say? So, I mean, yeah. I mean, just the fact that, that you're doing it is is to be honorable. If nobody's patting you on the back, I'm gonna pat you on the back. Ty gonna pat you on the back. Thank like, you. Y'all gotta keep going. And yeah. Catherine's been rubbing since she's been on here, so she'll rub you on the back too. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? It's okay. It's all right. You know what I'm saying? I also, I also just want to say, I think I, I um recently was thinking of this, like we're like going through a collective breakup, like we're breaking we're waking up but we're also breaking up with the, these systems and there's like a tenderness in that right oh, there's yeah. it, it's like it hurt like, and, and to there's a lot of grief at, around holding the reality of how much it's been internalized yeah. like how much all of that stuff lives in our bodies and our minds and our spirits and our hearts like that so as we're moving in these exciting directions like it's that stuff is inevitably going to come up so it for me it's a practice of like yeah, I freak out and Catherine's like the best at hope. We're also like part of our yin yin yang dynamic is that I'm a Cancer and she's a Capricorn, which are like compliments in astrology. Yeah. And so I'm like the watery emotional one and she's like the earthy grounded one. <laughs> and um I like, yeah, I definitely have like <laughs> called Catherine like crying at 1 a.m. <laughs> um we both have our moments though. But um, yeah, I think I think there's uh for me it's become a practice of noticing um like okay this is coming up and it's like it's coming up like thinking about tending to like an ecosystem like if there's a toxin in the environment you can't just like obliterate it and expect the environment to thrive like you have to be really intentional about how you're like removing the invasive species from that ecosystem and and like you're not just like hacking at it and like do, I mean, you could, I guess, but um, you know, you have to, you have to be like, Oh, there's another bud over there. Like, let's take that one out. And then like, maybe the next week it pops up again. And so I like thinking about it like that has, has made it feel like I'm, I don't get stuck in the, in the, what you're calling those like drips of doubt. It's yeah. I think those, those are actually important moments of me being called to, to divest more and divest more and divest more yeah for sure for sure Catherine what, what you say gonna say? Yeah. go ahead Catherine um I think this kind of speaks to all of it and also it being a challenge for me but the process of um believing in what we're doing and understanding that the financial um reward isn't the biggest piece of what we're doing mm. um and I think it's so hard. It's so difficult 
in the type of society we live in to not focus on making money and not prioritizing it. And when we're talking about generational wealth and curve and gentrification and um, all of those type of things and building new systems, um, you know, having money, having access to money is part of the problem and not being able to own homes and all of those things. And um, I think for me, especially coming from my background, I got into real estate because I wanted to own investment properties. And I was like, oh, you know, then I'll have residual income and I can, you know, dabble in these other things that I want to do. So thinking about in a co-op sense, it's like, when I think about a home and this is what I'm saying about like other people just selling their houses, I'm like, this is like your bank. This is a way for you to build generational wealth. But it's like when you're in a co-op structure, um, instead of you just having a bank, it's like you're paying into everybody's bank. Now we have a community bank. Um, and how much greater is that than you just being on your own on the island, um, you know, making mm -hmm. money or trying to figure these things out versus having that support from everybody around you. And I think one of the things that we really want to do with our co-op and not just in a real estate sense, but really build the community and create a more um, circular economy for ourselves so that you do have, so just like, you know, somebody's struggling and they uh, normally you would just be evicted out of this space, but it's like, okay, we have these different other resources and this other type of support that you don't see. We don't have that set up. So it's like, okay, let me, take a step back from just looking at this one property, like, oh, do you know how much money we can make off of this if we do it this certain type of way? And then it'll be this and that. Um, and looking at it from just like a different perspective of like community building and how much greater that could be than just the like self-service. That's that's a transition though, isn't it? I mean, that's a, that's a oh, major, yeah. particularly coming from the background that you, that you might've had, you know, you're like, you, <laughs> our, our, our our philosophy in America is capitalism. So if we're not making profit, exactly. what are we doing? Right? Exactly. If we're not making money, why are we doing this? This is this is pointless. How much money do we make? We didn't make any. So why are we even thinking about <laughs> right. continuing to do this? What this is pointless. And you know, I, I I always equate it to, I mean, I always talk about it too in terms of podcasts. People be like, Well, how much money are you making from your podcast? None. Like most podcasters, I'm not Joe mm -hmm. Rogan, so I I haven't cut my big million dollar check yet. And I notice I said yet because I, I I don't I'm not thinking like, oh yeah, well you know we're gonna make it tomorrow. Like no, it's it, it can happen. But if I don't do it because I love it, why am I doing it? Mm -hmm. It ain't about money because money money can come, money can come, money can go. But if you're if you're doing it for money only, you've already failed. You know, you've already failed in the process. It, there should always be something greater than financial gain. However, in America, that's not what it is. In America, it, it, it's all about financial gain. It's about all about how much money you make. And even in our community, in the black community, if somebody's making a lot of money, they're well respected. No matter how stupid the stuff they say to come out their mouth, they're still well respected. And that to me, that's preposterous. Like that's dumb. Like, I don't care. I don't care. Elon Musk is an idiot to me. I don't care what anybody says about how smart he is or anything. That man is that man makes the stupidest comments in the world. But everybody follows this man. And I think to to get to more of the of the course of what's important, what's important to our community, what's important, what are our values, what are our morals? It has to be more than about money. It has to be. You know, think about it. When you buy a home, even it's not about the money. It's about providing a roof over your family's head. It's about creating an environment for your family to grow in. It's mm -hmm. about having a place to grow with your family. So you can see your kids grow up until they graduate high school or whatever, that they had a place that that was their place, just like it was your home. That's the point of it. The point of it is yes to own property, but the point of it is to create memories and have foundations. That's really what it is to me. Now, it might not be like that everybody else, but that's really what it is. And if we focus more on the financial aspect, we will always continue to lose. We will always lose the more we focus on money. Money is a tool. It's not a, it's not the end of it's not the gold pot at the end of the rainbow. You know what I mean? If you if Emma, you walked out of the house that you guys invested in and you saw more co-ops going up around your around your neighborhood, I'm sure you would be like, even if it wasn't yours, I'm sure you would be like, I I love this, this, this what I'm seeing in my community. You know what I mean? You would feel better about it. You wouldn't feel like you, you you're fighting an uphill battle. 
I think, I think too, like back to Catherine's point, I, the other day we were having this conversation about banks being, um, because we're also like working on building a like cooperative banking system to go to tie into this. And, and like, there's, we keep calling it like the dollar pool, which essentially is what a bank is, right. Is like your community invest their money into this pool and then the bank plays around with your money and then the bank makes money off of it but that money doesn't cycle back into the community who pooled their money in the first place so how can we create systems where when we pool together our resources we actually get to see things invested in in our immediate spaces like I was looking at the Chase bank that's being built on 52nd street right now yeah and it's like clearly that institution has a shit ton of money it does not fit it like the level of development that they're doing to build that bank on 52nd street right on 52nd and market like it's oh, like yeah. the surrounding buildings have not been invested in in like years <laughs> and then they're building this like fancy ass decades not just years yeah decades <laughs> right yeah, so they're... like <laughs> So exactly. So I'm just saying like you're now you're coming in here and you're going to ask people in the in this neighborhood to bank at your bank and you're f- immediately setting it up as like flaunting like I have more I have so much wealth but then there's not that is that wealth going to actually benefit the people that is that wealth going to grow in a direction that invests in that community and almost a hundred percent of the time with bank with banks the answer is no it's not go credit unions but <laughs> I think, I think uh, and ideally a credit union is supposed to function in that way but but yeah we we want to um beyond that just like financial distribution needing to be deeply corrected I also um have we we talk a lot about this that there's in in this idea of a solidarity economy the return on an investment there that you value other forms of capital there's like social capital and spiritual capital and cultural capital so like actually me getting like what Catherine was saying gentrification erases a culture from the neighborhood it changes the energy of it it like whitewashes it however you want to describe that the if if people invest in ensuring that that development happens and is community-led then you the return is cultural capital you get to maintain that culture and that like um that people can actually value a return that's going to nourish you through the collapse of capitalism that is inevitably going to happen (laughs) i mean i I mean you talk about some deep stuff over there emma i mean people if people don't know there is a law called the community reinvestment act. You ever heard of that law? No. No. Okay. So that law was created because banks were not investing in the communities that they're in. So by law, banks are supposed to take a a certain portion of their profits and put it back within a community that that they're in, Hmm. whatever it may be, whether it be nonprofit, it'd be whatever, whatever. That's a law. Now, if you're telling me Chase's movie on 52nd street, Everybody knows Chase is not a community bank. We know that. Chase has never been a community bank. Chase has always been a bank that that you might think about in New York. Like, oh, man, like, you know. Mm -hmm. And the fees are high. (laughs) The deposits are high, all that stuff. I know we're talking about Philly housing crisis, but I think this is important because we have to just kind of segue this, right? So if you have a bank such as Chase moving into a community like 52nd Street that hasn't been transformed, yet because it will it's already starting the process they're there for the transformation they're there for the transformation <clears throat> they're t- they're going to they take know their, they, they know they, they, they probably have, buying up properties yeah. underneath left and nose. right and, and the thing mm-hmm. that you that you probably don't know is they probably already been in meetings with community leaders with council mm-hmm. people about these particular things and mm-hmm. what do they do they're going to say hey we we have this reinvestment that we have to do. We have to do it by law. So we're gonna we're gonna reinvest into this corporation or this organization, and then when the transformation comes, we'll we'll re, we'll invest into the things that we want to invest in. And it's not a lot of money to them because they're making billions of dollars. So what you have to realize is sometimes your eyes don't deceive you. Sometimes your eyes tell you more 
than what you can read on a piece of paper. And when you look at how banks, a bank like Chase, it used to be Citizens Bank. Citizens Bank is, was a community Philadelphia bank, that kind of thing. But when you look at the NPNC, for that matter, when you have those type of banks that come in, you just know that something is about to change. They've removed, as a matter of fact, on 52nd and Market, they removed the Citizens Bank from there. They removed the PNC that was over there. Mm-hmm. So they've removed these these institutions that sit in, in these in these communities for a long time. They removed them. Why did they take them out? Ty will tell you. Ty, why did they take them out of the community, Ty? I don't know, Jimmy. Can you please tell me why? I don't know. <laughs> they They took them out because the transformation of the community was already happening. If PNC and citizens can't be on 52nd Street, what the hell is going on? Mm. Now I'm a kid. Now I'm a I'm a credit union dude. All right. I I I hate banks. Always have. Always will. I don't even want to work for them. I hate them because I know what they do to the people that that they're supposed to take care of. Right. But for me, because I'm always so I'm always so keen to what's going on around. I can see how. 52nd Street is the heart of West Philly. It's really the Black Harlem of West Philly, okay? Mm-hmm. When you start making changes on 52nd Street, it, it's pretty soon all of West Philly will be completely changed. Catherine's sitting there shaking her head like, yep. Mm-hmm. So if if you think that, you know, I want to I wanna find a way for us to preserve everything that, we, that our generations before us have, have created for us. Really, to be honest, in today's day and age, that's a really hard task. That's a really hard thing to do. Not just because of money, but because of where people are, how they feel mentally. Like they don't feel like talking about this shit. This shit is over their head. This is not important to them. Okay. They're thinking about how much, how much it is at the grocery store, how much gas I can put in my tank. They're not thinking about their community changing or Philly housing crisis. Even though you got the the townhouses in U city going away, even though you have that, people are still thinking about, regular shit that really is not that's never going to change so if you stop thinking about that shit you're going to have to you're going to have to feed your family you have to put gas in the car there are things that we need to recognize that we're not recognizing there are solutions that we have emma and Catherine are definitely one of them there are solutions to this issue that we are not paying attention to now emma last time we talked you were like you know a lot of people you talk to they're talking about this issue Mm-hmm. They're talking about the cost of living. They're talking about how rent is so high. The cost mm-hmm. of homes are so high. They're astronomical. I don't even know if, I'm not sure what generation you and Catherine are in. I don't even know if your generation is going to be able to afford a house when they get to a certain place. Or the generation after you, to be honest. Are we going to be able to afford what a house is? That's why I think the housing crisis is important because it's not going to get no better. You know? Right. And I think, like you said, we're tender. We're kind of like, oh, ruffling the feathers. We're trying to figure it out. Like, okay, so what are we going to do with this change? It has to change. There's no way for us to survive if it doesn't change. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Ty, what you feel, bro? I'm liking the way this co-op is going. <laughs> Just listen, I'm liking the way it's going. I am. So where do y'all see yourselves in like five years with this? <laughs> um, in five years, we will have successfully curved gentrification in West Philly and we will have convinced the majority of residents in West Philly to invest in a large cooperative mission in an ideal situation I um no but for real I think I think that wait, 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 that's not for real that that is for real you can't just be she said it for mm-hmm. real you can't change which you can't manifest it and then change it Okay, but that's just like a big undertaking. I want to take a little bit of the pressure off of you, Catherine, <laughs> and just say that we, uh, in in five years, I think the goal, so, so for example, the house we just bought is next to an abandoned lot, okay. and it's on this block that has really strong community vibes, and they've been so welcoming and loving and just like really uh it feels like a really like tight-knit community and so it feels like a great space and it's in Cobbs Creek which is you know Mm -hmm. on the (laughs) on the way um and and so yeah ideally having commute we want to have community members of the co-op we want to have investor members resident members and staff members in five years and have have at least like a few residential properties and at least one commercial property um, so that we have enough 
uh of that like community process going on where we can say like actually we're not going to sell this house uh, or and maybe even having like a whole block in West Philly that's like this is like forever going to stay um permanently community. affordable and community owned okay. um i think also ideally on an internal level we will have um engaged in in some form of repair of all of the like mistrust and um individualism and like the way that we're energetically investing in capitalism uh on subtle levels so that we can actually activate a a new economy also in terms of location um i'm i'm not opposed to going to other areas in the city um I think right now we want to focus on West Philly and in terms of like purchasing real estate and building community, it's easier to do it just in one area, um, you know, and getting to know the people in the area and then they're more willing and more um, likely to say, okay, you know what, I won't put it on the market. I'll sell this to you. You know, I'm thinking about selling my house or whatever, you know what I mean? I just feel like it'll be, it's, it'll be easier for us to build in um, one space, but I think the thought is if we are able to successfully do this, well, we will successfully do this, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. in and doing we- that, <laughs> right. <laughs> in doing that, that um, we can be helpful to other people doing it in other areas. Um, or if, you know, we want to say, okay, now we want to venture out into this other space, other neighborhood and pop it off there and replicate the same thing or show somebody else how to replicate the same thing in their community. Um, I think that's kind of the goal. Which is honestly how, um, like, if as a resource going to um, the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative's website, they have, we, that is exact, like, there, it's very, it's a really easily replicable model. And they're, like, that as a resource is entirely what we've been working off of because they have all their bylaws listed and their process for purchasing property and their process for community decision making and their, pro- like, and it's it's mapped out in cartoons and it's really accessible. And um, uh, I think the goal, another thing that is shifting here too is moving away from this competitive market and into, uh, like, cooperation is actually, like, in some ways, a directly like a uh, divergence from that competitive way of relating. So that it actually, like you were saying, Jay, like if I leave this house and there's like three other preps in West Philly, like that's actually good for me, even if I'm not personally invested in them, because I actually, what I'm investing in now is building a world where, uh, developers can't swoop in and and decide what development looks like and actually there's community control and and actually like in a larger vision it's it's about like repairing relationship with the land with each other and having like a more healthy healthy connection to to why we're here Catherine I, I'm mm-hmm. sure when you have gone with Emma to certain places people probably feel so much like, I mean, Emma, what you, the way you talk about stuff, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way because what I'm going to say is probably be like, I, I'm, I am one of them myself. Like, you know, they'll, they'll be like, Emma's a socialist. Mm-hmm. Emma, Emma is not, she thinks, of, she, she doesn't think about, you know, making money. She mm-hmm. thinks about the community mm-hmm. more than, more than it's making money. And I, I think, you know, Emma, don't ever lose that, please please don't lose that about yourself i know you got to have the other strategy side i know you got to have that that understanding of it but don't lose that about yourself because i mean shit i lost it i i'm i'm the i'm i was such a freaking pessimist when i was the biggest like like i always thought about the the brighter side of things you know and how to improve certain things and shit happens in life when you lose that so emma don't lose that please don't lose that that is a, that is one of them traits that keeps you going and keeps you 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 rocking but Catherine, like, you know, I know it's tough to see what's going on in a community that you grew up in and then be a real estate agent at the same time and then want to help your people get to a certain place 
but your people necessarily don't want to be helped. Mm -hmm. Am I speaking? Am I? Am, are you understanding what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm probably uh -huh. saying it without, without saying it. But, um, I mean, what, what is that like for you? I okay. <clears throat> when I first started and I first got my license, I was working doing wholesale, which. I don't know if y'all are familiar, but when you get those things in the mail and it's like, hi, I'm so-and-so and, you know, I want to buy your property, all cash, no matter what condition it's in. Um, and so basically those are people who um, purchase properties for low, a, a low price, lower than what they would probably go for on the market um, and sell them to an investor, basically. And then they make the profit on the in-between. Um, and... I start off doing it and I'm just like, am I building or destroying in doing this? Yeah. And it was difficult morally for me to do it <clears throat> because essentially you're taking advantage of people who don't know that their house is worth more. And that's just the reality of the situation. Yeah. Um, so I remember it was one time somebody had a property, a triplex, really good property on, in West Philly on Samson Street. And the man was saying like, oh, he, he was thinking about selling it to us. And he was saying, you know, I wanted to keep it for my kids, but they're not interested in it. And so, you know, I, that's why I gave you a call back, you know, and think about something. But he was like, but listen, I've been getting a lot of these. So what's, what is it that's going on? And I said, oh, well, and I told him the truth because I, I just couldn't, I already felt bad about it. And um, those are things if I had a parent that had a bunch of property or had a triplex, I wish they would give it to me that like, yeah. this is part of the problem. Yeah. So um, I just told him, you know, like, you know what, this area is changing. It's a lot of development going on. And so, you know, the value is changing on these properties. It'll go up. And so he ended up not selling it to us at that time but I remember going back and telling the other people I was working with I was like yeah he wanted to but then you know he said he was keeping it for his kids and so I said da, da, da. and they were like no <laughs> like we about to get you off the phone so you talking to people out of selling these houses and so it's definitely challenging especially when when we're talking about home ownership me knowing having certain resources or knowing okay your barrier to entry is probably a lot lower than what you think it is and I could probably help you fill in the gaps for you to get a property or I see you're selling your house and going and moving out in the suburbs to be around more white people when your home in the city has more value and will continue to gain more value and outpace the suburbs and has been so you know it's very difficult to watch I try to explain as best I can but you know ultimately people are going to do what they want but also when it comes to gentrification you have to think like people aren't buying it's not they're not stealing these properties people are selling them yeah you know what I mean so it's also kind of like yeah and I've had this conversation with Emma it's like all of the people that are hot and ready to leave out of these areas is because they don't see the value in it the same way that the people are coming in are seeing. Yeah. They don't see what the potential is and they haven't been able to experience it in that way. Yeah. So while everybody else can come in and kind of wait it out and a coffee shop pop up and a friend buy the house and all of that, you might be strapped for money. You have kids, you want to send them to a better school district. Um, it's violent in the area. You want to get away from the violence. You yeah. know, it's all of these negative experiences that you can have um in these neighborhoods yeah. I mean we know how it is living here so it's definitely difficult to convince somebody that's had that experience yeah that there's value here and to stay here and to mm -hmm. don't sell your property or to you know do it a different way or if don't you want to give it to the co-op maybe we'll, we'll get it from you for market value but also you know what I'm saying like you're selling it to yeah the white man uh -huh. for a discounted price yeah and if i come and this happens also even with the wholesale situation in doing it they'll be quicker to sell it to and believe whatever price the white person is going to give them over if a black person come it's, it's, it's really strange oh you're getting but into it, oh you're getting into a whole nother I know. conversation <laughs> on that one I know. oh you're getting but, into a whole don't let no don't let no black person show up on your door talking about i want to buy your house they look at you like, you, I know. like Boy, you better get off my steps talking about you want to buy my house 
It, let, let let white boy come on there and talk about he's gonna buy your house. They're gonna, gonna be like, the same th- how yep. much how much you gonna pay me? That's what and they that's, gonna ask. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens. That's the philosophy. And so it is when it's like, oh well, you know what? It's only two more people on the block. Well, they sold their houses also. Yeah. So you know, it's it's difficult. It's it's difficult. It's definitely been a challenge. But that's why I, part of the reason why also, um, and getting with Emma and listening to her, I ideas about valuing things other than money and because i'm like i'm capricorn i'm super like let's get it money. um i can see the importance in it so um it was exciting to utilize the skill set that i have in real estate to be able to um do it a different different way yeah. and be more community building because that's yeah. how i'm like every day i'm selling to an investor i'm um every day i'm helping gentrification how do yeah. i how do i change that? this yeah how do exactly. i offset that yeah you're making money but you ain't feeling good about it right it's exactly. like it's, it's like damn i got i got this money in the bank but but my community is shit like this is right. good you know what i'm saying like how, how do i change what can and i do to change fast. this yeah it happens real fast mm-hmm. it happens real. in a matter of two years you can see a whole community change mm-hmm. drastically you know mm-hmm. drastically man you know, I could talk to y'all all day about this because for me, you know, listening to what you what you ladies have, your expertise, your knowledge about it is, I think it's vital. It's, I've learned a lot about what a co-op is, how your co-op works, what your ideas are for your co-op. Um, Ty, I mean, what you feel, Ty? You learned a lot. What, you learned a lot listening to them talk about their co-op? Yes, I did. And I'm interested in it. I mean, if I can get some more information on it, I'll be look, glad look, if look. you can say you something go. my way. You you got a shareholder right there. Look, shareholder right there. Mm-hmm. You, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? He, he he's ready to go get it. I mean, but that's and it, and that's that was really what I was saying. There are other people in the community who need to hear about your co-op. Now I know we we started about you know the Philly housing crisis, but I, this is a solution. I'm mm-hmm. big on solutions more more than addressing the problem. Let's talk about the solutions. And co-ops are definitely a solution to gentrification to you know um housing costs increasing it's a it's a solution to people having roofs over their head because to me that's just the basics you know those are the basics if you don't have a solution you're just talking and i mean what are you doing you're just talking about it so everything y'all everything you're talking about how you're talking about the philosophy behind it to me is important it's vital it's needed and you know i hope i really not even i hope i know you're going to be doing more of this. I know you're going to have more properties. I know the co-op is going to grow. And I say, I know that because I'm not just trying to manifest it. I mean, I see it. You guys are driven. You're like, yo, let's go get it. Let's figure this out. Let's work this out. You know, no matter what you have, as far as doubt, you you keep going. And that that's inspiring to see. It's inspiring to know, like, you know, you, you ladies aren't giving up. So, I mean, I think that's dope. I think that's super dope. Ty, what you, what you want to say before we head off, man? Don't stop doing what you're doing. You have a property now, just keep on going, you know? Just keep knocking heads and figuring things out. Just keep on moving. Y'all doing great. Thank you. Emma Emma and Catherine, anything y'all want to say to the people before we we head out? Mm, thank you so much for having us. This has been a great conversation. Yeah, I think uh, thank you for having us. It's been an awesome conversation. I'm leaving feeling super confident. <laughs> imposter syndrome slayed and um yeah I guess to the people uh if you want to connect with us more right now we're operating under this uh organization called the wild ride we you can email us at wildridecollective at gmail.com um and and right now I guess we're kind of in a phase of of researching and learning and and like curious if there are community members who live in Cobbs Creek and and like want to strategize for what building this cooperative can look like so we're open and we're excited yes you should be excited you should you should definitely be excited I mean um, I'm excited about what you're doing I'm excited about your future you know the basics to me are people people need a place to live and today the cost of living is is tough. I'm not just going to say it's tough. It's almost impossible for people. And this isn't just about inflation. This isn't just about the cost of gas going up. This is uh, this has been going on well before that. You know, 
gentrification is real. Gentrification is obvious. And there are many people who listen, who might listen to this podcast and be like, yo, they talked a lot about all kinds of stuff. We have to realize our communities are changing. And as they change, we have to change with them. But we have to change in a more strategic manner to combat what we what we have to change with because otherwise we get sucked into it. You know, we want to follow what they do. We want to do what we want to act like they act. But in actuality, true happiness is doing what you do for yourself that you love, that you feel better about, that you feel happy about. If you go you go to sleep every night, you can wait and you go to sleep and you know you've done something good and you've helped somebody else, that's always a plus. And I think that's what it's all about at the end of the day. It's about helping each other. It's about community. It's about love. You know, it's about truth and it's about honesty. With this housing thing that we're facing right now, I just wish everyone out there, you know, you be safe. You find a place that you that you can live safely. You find a place that you can live with your family. You know, for ones that are out there looking, I hope you find something soon. But I also hope that you, you know, you find a different way to make it because we got we to gotta change how we're doing it. We got to change how we're doing it. But I want to thank Emma. And Catherine for coming on. This has been great. This has been this has been really dope. I think that, you know, in time, people will definitely feel like, you know, this was very, very productive. Um, permanent real estate cooperative family. Remember you go check it out. Please make sure you check it out. These ladies are doing some great things. Um, as I always say at the end of every podcast, I hope that you call someone and tell them that you love them because you never know when you might get another chance. Spread love, not hate. Spread truth, not lies. And I wish you all the best tomorrow. Y'all have a great one. Jimmy Bonds, Ty Money, Lucy Lou. We out. Peace. Fam, that's going to wrap the show. We want to thank you for listening to Jimmy Bonds Podcast on Philadelphia Radio. We ask you to leave your comments and questions at 844-844-1244. Again, that's 844-844-1244. You can also email us at jimmybondspodcast at gmail.com. Again, that's jimmybondspodcast at gmail.com. That's J-I-M-M-Y-B-O-N-D-S podcast at gmail.com. Now, remember, family, we are still in a COVID-19 pandemic. So please, please, please remember to wash your hands, wear a mask, and practice social distancing. Also, remember to take nothing for granted and value every opportunity you have with your friends, your family, and your loved ones. For in these times, every moment is sacred. So until the next episode, you can find me on Go Hope Road, screaming, stay up, don't sleep in your dreams. I'm Jimmy Bonds, and I'm out. Fight on, come on. Fight on.